Okay. But that's where they can tell us your last film sucked. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should we encourage people to introduce themselves by saying where we're calling in from? Um, so, I mean, yeah. I am what going to be hosting the chat today with Alex uh, and I'm calling in from London. I'm Orla. Hi. Hello. From London. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm Philip. I'm calling in from uh, Montreal. Nice yeah. to meet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Alex. I'm here from, I'm in Toronto at the moment. And I'm Mina. Um, whoops. Did I that work? I'm Mina. I'm from Van I'm in Vancouver. So that's eight time zones. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very fun. Uh, so we have uh, Lisa from Boston and um, Daria from Nanamia. So Nanaimo. we have Nanaimo. That's, yeah. That's uh, misspelled Nanaimo. Okay. Cool. I could be wrong. <laughs> Uh, and then Chrissy from Los Angeles. Uh, so should we just start introducing this and then um, people will filter in. So, okay. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to Lockdown Film School, which is our weekly discussion series in which we put two filmmakers in the same field in conversation with each other. So this is our sixth session. Uh, and we plan to keep running Lockdown Film School uh, at least until the end of July. So you can catch up with our past sessions on YouTube at Seventh Row, uh, and there are links to those on our website. Uh, so since the beginning of Lockdown Film School, we've aimed to spotlight some of the best talent behind the camera, including many Canadians. So if you'd like to catch up with past episodes, we've talked to several other Canadian filmmakers, like nonfiction filmmaker Carol Nguyen in episode one, and cinematographer Catherine Lutz in episode two, uh, and writer-director Animont in our last episode. Um, so today we're excited to welcome two directors who are Canadian national treasures, Mina Shum and Philip Valadeau. Both filmmakers have achieved international recognition, but fortunately continue to make incredible films about specifically Canadian stories. So I'm going to introduce both of them now. Uh, Mina Shum was born in Hong Kong and raised in Canada and is based in Vancouver. Shum has directed multiple feature films, Double Happiness, Drive, She Said, Long Life, Happiness and Prosperity, The Documentary Ninth Floor and Meditation Park. She's also directed television, including October Faction, Murdoch Mysteries, and Double Happiness won the Best Canadian Feature Special Jury Citation at the Toronto International Film Festival. Night Four was one of Canada's top 10 films, and Shum has been nominated for multiple Genie Awards. The Philippe Fardeau is a Quebec-based screenwriter and director whose latest film, My Salinger Year, was the opening night gala at the 2020 Berlinale. His feature, Monsieur Lazare, was nominated for the Best Foreign Language Oscar and won Genie Awards for Direction and Adapted Screenplay. His political satire, My Internship in Canada, was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for Original Screenplay and was one of Canada's top 10 films. His other Canadian features include, um, well, his other features include The Good Lie, Chuck, and My Salinger Year. So, uh, we're going to structure this talk by leaving the first sort of 45 minutes to a conversation between the two of our guests facilitated by Alex. And then at the last sort of 15 minutes, we're going to turn it over to audience questions. So uh, we are going to, so throughout the talk, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's like a Q&A feature. So you can ask questions there and I'll be looking at them throughout the talk and then I'll pick out the best ones and ask them. So make sure you're doing that throughout. But I'm gonna turn it over to Alex now. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I guess I wanna start by just talking about what got you both interested in filmmaking. And I guess because you also have write a lot of your own scripts, what got you interested in also writing as well? Mina? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it, 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 I've always wanted to do what I'm doing right now. And since I was 12, I was trying to make sense of the world through the pen, trying to write. 
Um, and then high school came theater and university came film. And I mean, I think, I think the pursuit of figuring out how to write a story to affect people and change a person while they're sitting there in a dark movie theater, because I've been so changed in my life watching films. Um, it's something I've aspired to and I continue to aspire to. So that, that's really what got me into it. I mean, I think just loving cinema when I was very young, being, being touched by cinematic, I didn't know it was called cinematic language, but just the shot of the dock with the man and the woman saying goodbye affected me. And I didn't even have the sound turned on when I was a kid. You know, I was like five years old. My parents thought I lost my mind, but it was really at that point, I kind of, it was, I mean, I remembered it vividly and it's still the thing that drives me now is like, can I tell it with visuals? Can I, can I, can I, can I use the form in a different way that's different than playwriting, than novel writing? Um, there's something very special about what, what this language is. I'm still figuring it out, so. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I grew up in, um, in a small town in Quebec uh, uh, and we only had American films really uh, and a few French films. And there was no way I was going to dream about making films. It was not remotely in my mind, um, except for sometimes when I went to sleep or even waking up. I, I, I was waking up with, with, with images of, of films that didn't exist in my mind. But that was just like a fantasy uh, that was not grounded, grounded in any uh, real uh, drive to, to make films. It, it was not something that was accessible to me. Um, and uh, it was by a series of accidents, really, uh, and, and weird turns in my life. Uh, I, I ended up um, in, in making this, this um, trip around the world for the, for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, called The Race Around the World, where it was a kind of a, a show where eight young contestants had to travel around the world alone with an SVHS camera and make 20 films in 20 different countries. It was a crazy thing, and I applied for that not to do it, but to just dream about doing it. Just like you buy a lot of a lot of ticket, you don't buy a lot of ticket for to become millionaire, but to dream for a week of what you would right. do with that money. And and because I studied political science, and I was kind of thinking about being a journalist or working in international relations, and I was selected to do the uh, the race in 1993. And when I came back, I I thought, oh, this is a medium that, and I I was not super good at it but it was something that I wanted to explore and I had a lot of catching up to do because I only knew of like American films and American directors and weirdly enough um, I saw Mina's film when I came back from uh, from the race uh, in 94 and that was an influence actually in men it's it's a bit of a coincidence that we're doing that today but Mm. It, it, uh, it was one of the first movie I saw that was not a Hollywood movie that, that moved me, that touched me. Um, and I thought, oh, we can also do like those kind of films. But even at that time, I was probably going towards documentary films and another series of weird accident happened and I did my first feature film. So that's how I got. And I still wondering what I like. I, I, I still believe that one day someone is going to stand up in a room and point at me and, and, and say, you you're an imposter get out of here we know you can't really make films that's how i feel about my craft and i i agree with mina i'm the more i know about making films and more i know i can't I, it's really tough and and i still have a lot to learn i just have to say monsieur lazar was a huge influence on meditation park which is the last really? feature i just did so we're coming around here <laughs> this, this is not scripted folks no that's this was crazy. not planned <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's funny, you know, you talk about American film and how, um, because I, it was not accessible to me. I had immigrant parents. There was no way I was going to film school. But I saw Gallipoli when I was in high school. And it was an Australian film. And it was just told in a different way. And it made me suddenly realize there might be room for me in all of this. Like, it was one of the first non-American films I saw, right? So, so similar. You had an um, epiphany. I had an epiphany. Yeah, yeah. I'm still waiting for mine, though. <laughs> yeah. 
are there things that you're both currently thinking about just about your craft that you want to think more about or explore in, in your future work? Well, I, I've explored the form quite a lot, starting with a, a mockumentary uh, and, and, um, I've, I've, and every film is, is quite different. And if there's one thing, I'm not completely happy with any of my films, to be honest. I have a real hard time watching them. And I, and, um, but I, there's one thing I'm happy is I've, I've tried different things. Um, and I've tried also to, to, to first sit down and think, okay, this is what I want to talk about. What's the best form to talk about mm. that specifically? But I do envy the time where I didn't think so much and experience wasn't there so much. So I didn't get the lux I didn't have the luxury of thinking, or say, I should approach this this way because it makes more sense regarding this and that. And I just did it. And that's how I did basically my first two feature films in which I think the forms were, were more challenging. And I think they also uh, st stood the, the test of time. Uh, but basically, every time I approach a film, I, I try hard to think about what's the subject matter and what's the best form to serve that subject. And Mina? I, it's, it's very hard. It, it's very important for me to, to reach a little higher than I reached last time. Whether, whether, it, it's not necessarily budget even. Like I was, um, I'm part of this project that Ingrid Benninger in Toronto initiated during COVID. Um, she got nine female filmmakers from all over the world with the idea of making one film together in segments about our isolation. And we were allowed to do whatever we wanted. And we're in isolation, there's no tools, right? Like there's, I don't have my crew. And I immediately started going, oh, I could just go back to like um, one of my docu memoirs and to discuss my time with my family, my, my mother particularly who had to stay uh, away from us because she's older, she's compromised. And I immediately thought, oh, I can do that. That'll be easy. But as soon as I started thinking about it, I was really, it wasn't, I didn't feel like an imposter, but I felt like I was repeating myself a little bit. And I wanted to, and, and so I sat down and I went, what is it that you as a filmmaker right now want to do? I mean, uh, you've done five features, you've done shorts, you've directed, what is it? And I was like, I would love the challenge of making a isolation film that is in the fiction practice, my fiction practice, without anyone in it. So then I got myself into, I wrote a script, and I'm the voiceover, exterior, park, day. Uh, you know, and I lead us to this fictional story, but there's no one in any of the That's shots. Great. That's a great idea. I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> so do you know what happened, though? You know, you're talking about, like, creating problems. At one point, I was ready to kill myself. Because <laughs> when the first cut came together, it was like, it is not working. Nobody knows what's ha happening. Why are we looking at these empty benches? And I continued. We, we just, I just delivered the film on Monday. And now I'm sad because I solved that problem. That problem, it worked. And to me, like, it's not even, it's not my biggest work. It's not my longest work, it's none of that. But I challenged myself to reach, to try something in form and content that was different than I'd ever done before. And, and of course, Tuesday, when we, we delivered on Monday, on Tuesday, I was sad. I was like, oh, I don't have a problem to work on right now. I just have screenplays to work on that aren't finished, you know? But the, the fact that I had something very specific, that kind of drove me. So um, yeah, and that's a very small movie compared to the screenplays I'm writing, which some of them are period pieces. Like they take place in a different time. They're going to be expensive. There's going to be people in them, right? But to, to work completely differently, it just gave me, gave me a sense of hope that I could keep learning, that I learned something new. That's, that's great, uh, but and, and there's, there's a misconception that short films are, are easier. They're actually harder to make. I think they're harder. And I think they're harder, yep. We, we ask young people to start with short films. We should ask people to do short films after they've done three feature films yeah, because yeah. it's a much harder format. We just ask them to do that because it, it costs less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to get inside a story inside of like one minute or two minutes or five minutes, extremely difficult. I mean, just just conveying a point of view and and what you've described is is what we also live through when we 
assemble our film, whatever, uh, if it's um, a short or a feature, you watch the first assembly of your ideas and it does, it never makes sense. I mean, a script, <laughs> you think a script is good? Yeah, but once you see the images assembled as the script is telling you to do, it usually is a big blob and you still have to work on it and to work on it. And, and that's, the, that's the depression part for me. But I roll up my sleeve and I start working the problem. I like that expression. We don't have that expression in French, work the problem. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's very true in, 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 in cinema. And like you, one of the film I love the most that I did is a short film about four minutes and you don't, you'd only see my hands. And I, so, I, I cut, cut out pictures and catalogs of different kind of women, women I don't, don't know, like they were cut from anywhere. It's the woman of my life, but told through my voiceover and hands showing oh. the camera. And yeah. that I think is my best work. And I can't show it anywhere because I don't have the rights to those pictures. <laughs> for, to those pictures. So right. I've shown that, I shown that, that film uh, in Montreal in special screenings that we had here called Kino, mm. but I've never shown it to a general public. But I'm, I'm looking forward to see that film, though, that you just mentioned. Yeah, when, yeah. When is that collective coming out? Um, we're, uh, we're screening it for TIFF at the end of this month, I believe. Cool. Congrats. Yeah, wow. yeah thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really quite proud of it. Just because I didn't have... It's like we decided... We're, we were nine people, that nine directors that didn't know each other, right? We knew Ingrid, the producer, yeah. and who's also one of the filmmakers. But we didn't know each other. We decided to trust each other and trust that it would work and it it does there's like there's a film at the end from a woman named Lydia Zimmerman who is from Spain German filmmaker living in Spain and I'm it has my, her film has nothing to do with my film but I'm really proud that her film is with my film like it's not even because her imagination brought something that was different than mine so it's it's kind of it's this collective unconscious right trying to trying to capture that so how did you guys work that did you see the other people's work before finalizing the cut of your own segment uh we yes we all delivered cuts so that we could see but but we'd already shot like people had already yeah. gone this is my idea i'm throwing down my idea um what we did do was uh, we worked collectively on finding the order of the films uh i mean definitely ingrid was spearheading that with her editor rick bardham but but it was, uh, and, and the, first, the whole thing started with the Zoom conversation with all of us. And all we did was write words, one word that we felt at this time that reflected our film. Uh, and and our, your film could completely diverge from that in the making of it, but just that we would keep that together. And uh, I mean, it's definitely nine works, but I think it makes a complete statement once you put it all together. And it's partly, she chose women, she chose writer directors. Um, it was, uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, you know, you put yourself, you put yourself on the ledge. That's what you yeah, do when course. you try to well, tell us. That's story. pretty courageous, actually. <laughs> I, I kind of turned turned down a few offers to do stuff like that because I, I was too afraid to just like break my neck. <laughs> it, it well, at one point, well, you know, I was like in the back of my mind going, "If it sucks, you can always quit." <laughs> you know, like that. But of course, I'm not like that. But I. I did have, I was like at one point going, I can't think of anything I like. I mean, I think one of the things in terms of, uh, for me, when a film becomes a movie, not just an idea, is that you're so, it's like being in love. And you're pursuing and pursuing and pursuing that person until you, you, you finally get close enough. And then there's a whole other thing to figure out who they are. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, but, the, but, the, the love, I like the love metaphor, but I don't, I've always seen it as a as a child rather than a lover. Well, it's your lover because you're kind of uh, at the beginning. You you have to be a one hundred percent with the film and the creation process. Yeah. But once you're finishing the film, it's more like a child because it 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 takes a life of its own and it's it kind of directs you to finish yeah. it. I right. always thought that you know I'm writing. I think it's about something. I'm shooting. I said, oh, it's about this. And then you finish <laughs> the editing. I said, oh, it was about that. And then the film is released and the audience talks to you and say, oh, your film was about that. And it's never about the same thing and right. because the film has a, a personality of its own and find yeah. its, finds its own journey and its own path. Yeah, I agree that, that it is, becomes a child at some point. 
once you finish pursuing it and you have to put it together, it becomes your child. Cause you have to kind of, it, 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 it does take, it's amazing what people will say about the movie. You know, like you're, you're like, wow, I didn't intend that at all. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the richer it is. It, it's yeah. That it's, there's something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you both have made films that I feel, I feel like a lot of Canadian films try to hide their Canadianness. Um, <laughs> but um, I feel like both of you have made films that are very like upfront, but this is a Montreal story, or this is a Vancouver story, or we're dealing with Canadian politics. Um, and that's something that I really love about your films that there's that you tell these sort of specifically Canadian experiences often. And I'm wondering about what sort of got, gets you interested in telling these stories and <laughs> um, if it, how it's important to you, or if it is, I guess, to continue to engage with Canadian stories. Well, I'm, I, my answer might disappoint you, but I've never considered my stories to be Canadian or, or, or from necessarily from Quebec. And I'm a bit of a, uh, in, in, in the, the Quebec portrait of like general filmmaking, I usually, I don't talk about myself in my film. I talk about others like Sudanese refugee or Belgian engineer or uh, uh, um, uh, an Algerian immigrant. Uh, maybe because I did that race around the world I told you about and, and that got me, I had to come into a country I didn't know. I had to meet the other uh, in an, in, through a language that was not familiar to me shoot it, lock myself inside a hotel room and try to say something about this culture or this person I was, I was meeting. And so I, I, I still have the same, I think, reflex of, of, of curiosity um, when I, 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 uh, I choose a, a subject for my films. Um, and, and, and that's why in many ways, Mina's film was important to me in, in my development because it was about uh, Chinese Canadian, um, and it, it opened my eyes on a, on a reality I knew of, but never from the inside, never intimately. Um, and and uh, she, she was from that community, but I could I was always the outsider looking in when I was tackling these these uh, subjects. Um, so I never I, you never wake up in the morning. So let's let's choose a Canadian subject and I. It doesn't happen like that, and I every year uh, when I every time I, I I release a film and I'm at I'm at TIFF or whatever, and people ask me what is a Canadian film, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I truly don't. Uh, that's not how the creative process works at all for me. Yeah, I would have to agree. I would never. I don't even think of my work as sh like if it's Chinese or a Ninth Floor that I'm telling a Caribbean immigrant story. I don't even, I, I think about what I think <laughs> it has to do with being the more specific, the more universal. This idea of like, if I can, whatever that story is, it should, it should be a hero for all time and all peoples. Um, I'm never thinking about, I mean, there was a lot of talk when I was in film school about cultural flag waving that you would go, this is a Canadian film and look, the Mountie just went by in the scene or, or it's a Chinese movie, so let's have them all doing Tai Chi in the park. You know, there's certain cliches that, that in a way I would avoid. Like, I, I wanna go deeper than that. I always think about going like, what is the specific that can touch someone from, that I don't even know from around the world who would see this and be touched by Jade the hero. So, um, but it is important to me to acknowledge the specific uncomfortableness of my world whatever that is, whatever is going on um, and try to reflect that. And, and often it's like, you know, I'm, I point my camera outside because it's accessible as opposed to going, I'm gonna make a, a film about the, uh, uh, the plague in Spain in 18, <laughs> you know, like that's not, that's, that's not gonna happen, right? Like I'm not, I'm not able to probably conjure the budget for that or um, even tackle the emotionality or the philosophy of that. That's just not something, it's just too big. Whereas if I go, a woman loses her, a woman is in an uncomfortable relationship with her partner and we're in a pandemic. Like that's an, that to me, 
I can chew on because that's interesting. Like, so the pandemic is the, is the overview. Yeah, but what if, what if your agent sends you a beautiful script about a woman's point of view during the plague in Spain? Right. Uh, a very intimate film, like a period piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because oh. I, I I I think I'm I'm with you on that. I've 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 read many scripts and I thought, wow, I I can't wait to see that film. But I'm not the right person to do that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But I think it it doesn't have to do with scope or far as if it's far away from us. I think it has to do with can I find a personal insight uh, into that movie? Yeah. Uh, or do I have a personal insight like? Uh, and something uh, personal to say uh, about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I also think that uh, it's probably, and if, if we're going to talk about Canadian film, the challenge for English speaking directors, I think is greater because they're directly competing with Hollywood. And right. they, they right. mostly lose their big star actors very fast to Hollywood. You, you, right. Your friend, with Sandra Ho, which is great and mm -hmm. probably has allowed you to keep working with her. But mm -hmm. we don't have that problem in, in, in French Canada. It's too small. We don't have a, we have our little star system, but it has nothing right. to do with America or France. So right. we keep making films in our own little bubble and not, we're not competing with American films, never. Mm -hmm. And you're competing, but you don't have the same budgets, yeah, <laughs> obviously, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the same budgets to promote the film. Um, so that I think that's a major, major difference, um, and it, it has set the bar higher for English Canadian filmmakers. Yeah, I feel like I just I'm trying to make good films, so I don't think in terms of competing with America, but I do. I do want to add something that's personal in terms of my point of view, what it is that that gets me up in the morning. Like, actually, I, 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 I recently read something about directing actors uh, and it's, they, they, it was Judith Weston. She wrote a book called Directing Actors and she's, she's the guru to other directors to talk to actors. And one of the things in directing television that she says is, even if it's a episode of Little House on the Prairie and you never ever live that life, you as a director have to figure out what's personal about it to be able to talk to the actor, really, to be able to talk to the DP, to be able to yeah, assess. Yeah. Um, and, and so it is It is point of view in so many ways. It's like nobody else is sitting in your point of view. So, and that that's just all very distinct. Agreed. I'm talking about your collaborators, um, I know you both have sort of worked with some of the same people over over many over many years in many films. Um, most visible would, of course, be Sandra O oh in your films, Mina. But I know you've worked with the same cinematographer, and Philippe, you've worked with the same cinematographer and um, composer. And I'm sure there are more that I'm that I'm missing. Um, and I'm wondering a bit about these, you know, the these long term collaborators that you have and how you're. <laughs> excuse me, collaborations have evolved with them. And I guess, um, you know, you, you're talking about losing people to the States. Like, I mean, I don't know something that you mentioned to me, you know, when we were talking about Meditation Park is that one of the advantages of all the film films that get made in Vancouver is you have sort of world-class people that you can work with in Vancouver. Yeah, it was actually quite funny. Um, on this little short that I just did, I had to, sh most of it was found footage, stuff that I have in the house that I made this, this short with no people in it. Um, but I had to shoot one scene. And one of my best buddies from film school is Greg Middleton. He's a DP who shoots Game of Thrones and Watchmen. And, and we're in the park. He's got his Watchmen or Game of Thrones hat, Watchmen crew jacket. And we've got one little 5D camera and it's, and I'm holding the flag to the sun. <laughs> you know? So, but, but it was his, Partly our collaboration actually on the on this little on, in this park, which was our set, of the way we've worked together in the past. Uh, it really was a shorthand, and my um, our trust with each other meant we were able to play and make it better than just a, a bunch of shots of the park. I was like, yeah. what can we do? What can we do to actually infuse this with the meaning we want? 
um, how do we know that that's the close up of a person that's not there? How do we know that that's the long shot of her walking? Well, you know, all that stuff, with, it was crazy making actually. But, but yeah, it is partly, we have a lot, we have experienced people here and I'm lazy as I gotta say, like I work with Andrew Lockington, the composer uh, a couple of times because we work so well together or Peter Onestorf, the DP on the features also, I'm lazy. We have an established relationship. We can grow together as opposed to me walking, having never met someone and reestablishing that. Sometimes that works too, but it, it does, I mean, I can't, you know, it's the French New Wave. They did that, right? They worked with the same people over and over yeah. again. So um, it's nice. I mean, even like on, on this last meditation park, it was uh, Greg Middleton, who was shooting, who was camera operating for a couple of days, Peter Onestorf, DP, Sandra and me, Sandra O. Oh, and we're all on set and she just looked and she goes, oh my God, this is like my first film with you guys. She looked at us looking at her, right? And that gave her comfort in a way, because it's history, right? So. I don't know you. So, so what, Philippe? Why, why is? <laughs> well, I, I, I understand the type of laziness you're talking about. And when we mention the word lazy to people, they usually frown, saying, "No, you're not lazy." <laughs> yes, we are lazy. But um, uh, what you're talking about is also about being faithful to people who oh, yeah. have allowed you to be successful. I mean, we know it's a, it's redundant. It's a collaborative effort, and. And uh, if we succeed, we owe it to so many people. And I try, because of the way the, 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 you finance a film and the timing of making a film, you often have to, uh, you, you can't always secure the collaboration of people you want to work with because they're, they have to choose between projects or mm -hmm. your project is dragging too long. So they're gonna hop on, other, on another project and you can't ask people to wait for you. In, in such an uncertain environment. So, but I always try to have at least one or two key people and it can be sound, uh, music. Mm. Um, and I've been working here in, in, in uh, Quebec with always the same producers. And I mean, we know each other by art. It's like mm -hmm. playing on the same line in the hockey, you know, where right. the other guy, you don't have to look before shoot, you know, passing the puck. It's, it's right. almost as, so, but it, and it's important to keep a, a certain core Uh, and but I think it's also good to meet other people. I mean, um, uh, I, I the last film I've made. I think the best part of the film is the the image on my Salinger year, and it's uh, Sarah Michara, whom I've never worked with, and and she, because my guy like went on to do some other film, and it was a blessing in disguise. And I told him that uh, because mm -hmm. I discovered this this well, I didn't discover her. She was a, I mean, but we worked for together for the first time and she became the guardian of my own intentions because we we mm -hmm. talked about it so much and then we got on the set and sometimes i would want to maybe cut the corner short and she would say well philip that's an interesting idea but it's not your film this is mm -hmm. and and so like good collaborators don't have big egos and they'll protect the, your original idea and they'll fence off other exterior <laughs> external forces, whether they're like financial forces or the, mm -hmm. produ the production. Um, so it's important to, to keep it. I think it's important also for young filmmakers to grow with people of your own generation and allow also a certain influence from other generations, but make sure that you work with people with no egos, no big egos, and will allow you To, 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 to put forward your own vision uh, and, and, but grow with people your age, I think it's important too. I always talk about it in terms of serving the story, in terms of no ego. So you're not yeah. serving my, you know, it's not like the director's vision. There's a story and there's a vision that comes with that story to be expressed. And we're there to, prote we're there to enhance that and protect that. It's you're you're right, and I, I think the big the, the the nicest lesson in that vein I got was from um, well Reese Witherspoon agreed to play in one of my film called The Good Lie about mm -hmm. South Sudanese refugees, and when I pitched the film to I, it was not my project, but when when I went to pitch my 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 ideas, I said we should take real South Sudanese refugees, and they, mm -hmm. they, said, they said, no, what do you mean? No, no, no stars, no actors. And I said, no. 
and they said, well, we should take like for the, 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 the supporting role, it should be some time, someone who's, because for financial purposes, you need right. to start to finance the film. And so it was hard to find someone who would agree to, to serve the film like that, not be at the center stage of the film. And, and right. Reese loved the story, loved the South Sudanese story, the story of the Lost Boys. And mm -hmm. she agreed to play this supporting role mm -hmm. in a cast where most of the people were had never been seen on big screen before. Right. Uh, and and I, I really realized there that when you have like like the, the 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 smart ones, the big talents, the smart ones, they know they're working for the film and not for themselves. Um, Philippe, you're talking about sort of keeping the same similar core together. Um, and, I, and because you've also worked in the U.S., what is that like to sort of bring some of your team with you into those U.S. projects? It, it, it's, uh, it's paramount. I mean, I wouldn't go in alone. <laughs> it's like you need a wingman or wingwoman. Right. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, a, it, it's an hostile environment <laughs> where, where, where politics and money dictates a lot of things and, and you need a wingman or two or wing women or two and i've had the, the the opportunity to work always with my editor and at least like a dp and and sound people and uh and they know the the, the people in hollywood are smart if they know that if if they want the, the best from you you need your toolkit you they, yeah. they need to allow you to bring your own toolkit Right. Uh, and then there's part of it that's a discussion and casting is certainly always a big discussion that's out of our hands, basically, because it's in the financier's hands. And that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest um, uh, advantage of making films in Canada, because ultimately, I mean, we can get subsidy to make our films. We could get financing to make our films and casting um is relevant but is not the most relevant thing for financing a film in Canada and certainly not in Quebec but in the states uh, it certainly is. Um, so Mina when I first interviewed you about um, Ninth Floor um, something that you said was that in Canada we're racist but we like to apologize about our racism <laughs> and I've been thinking about that a lot recently for um, I guess obvious reasons, um, but I'm, I mean, both of you have made films that um, either directly or sort of indirectly address racism and, and you know, Ninth Floor is, is specifically about um, anti-Black racism. And I guess I'm wondering how you both see like how your films that sort of talk about people who maybe considered the other, you know, what can they, how can they help? What can they do to sort of generate empathy? Uh, I'm going to have to defer to Mina on that one. <laughs> oh, me too. I mean, <laughs> well, what can, what can the common, what can the regular person do or what, or what can filmmakers do, Alex? Oh, what point? can film do? What can film do? Yeah. Well, okay. So here's an example. Um, I was, I've, I've been recently given a script that I didn't write. Uh, and uh, it was two movie stars in a, in a, in a, very well written kind of notebook romance, right? And I read it and it was a dated script, but it was a good script. And they were like, what would you do as a director? And, a, and a, in a rewrite, what would you do? And I said, I'd make, I'd set this whole thing in an immigrant community so that the people are people of color who are falling in love. So that the predominant, it's, it's the same language of a romantic drama, but we cast it so that we're get not only are we being taken away by this big Hollywood movie about in a, in a romantic way in a very mainstream sort of story, but we're also getting a look at culture and familial ties and how how two people of color are in a romance as opposed to um, two blonde movie stars. <laughs> really, basically, it was written kind of generic, and I wanted to go specific, and they loved that idea. So to me, I feel like even though it's an entertainment I'm pitching, it's not a documentary about some terrible incident that happened. It's, um, it's an entertainment, but because I'm actually casting the roles as people of color, you're getting an insider look into, uh, 
it's just two things. It's as simple as like, you know, in order to be it, you got to see it, right? So it's promoting stars. It's promoting um, unusual uh, heroes that haven't been uh, normally in the mainstream. That's, that's kind of like, even, even when I direct television, even in a Murdoch mysteries, which took place in, takes place in 1910, I'm casting bit parts uh, with people of color that aren't written that way. But it, it's important because I've been doing this for a while where there were no actors of color who had experience. It's really important to give those parts to people to have shine a light. Also, it's as simple as financial. That actor gets to work some more on their acting craft because they got paid as a day player. They get to write their play. So it's, 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 to me, it's not just visual, but it's, it's socioeconomical as well, just having, having that presence. I agree. Um, I completely agree. I think the the best way for us to do something about it is to, um, when we're going into casting, open up our casting and mm. and 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 forget about the color of the actors who come in, and and but make sure that there are diversity in the casting room, and it's great. This idea you had about that specific script is great because. It's, it's the, the script is not about that. And it will become a little bit about that in, in the background. Once That's you it. start staging the film, yeah. we, the audience, get to know them a little bit better, although it is not about the Black community, it's not about... Okay. And I think that's the best way to go about it. Um, in, in my Salinger year, I've... Uh, I just asked the, 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 the casting person to be really open about it and bring the best people she thought of inside the room. And I met this guy, amazing talent, Hamza Haq. You can see him on television, CTV. He's like the, the first, uh, he's the main role in Transplant. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we had such a good time. And I knew I had a role for him. I didn't know which, which one. And then I had a call back. I had him called back for another role. And he's... Agent said, yeah, Philip Farado wants you to see you back, but, you know, don't think that you'll get the job of, of, of the, 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 the ex-boyfriend, because that was, the, that was the part. It was just the ex-boyfriend, sweetheart, love, love that, she, that the, the, the main character decides to, she decides to break up with him and she regrets it. And so it has nothing to do with race. And Hamza is, is um, of uh, Pakistani origin. Um, and his agent said, you know, it's not a terrorist. It's not, a, so forget about it. They're, they're going to end up using another guy. Right. But he decided to come anyway because he had a good time when we met, when we first met. I gave him the role and I, I, I mean, that was one of my best moves ever. And so we have this beautiful scene where there's a waltz scene in the movie and he's, he's, he's waltzing with, with his girlfriend. And at the end of the day, it was shot during a night. And he said, and I said, well, that was uh, Hamza's last scene. And we uh, applauded. And he said, I want to say something. And then he said, I never, to tell the whole crew, I never get to play this. Right. I never get to play the ex-boyfriend. Right. I always, I'm always asked to play hang angry young men because of what I look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he started to tell us that and we all started to cry basically. Right, um, yeah. And I thought, oh boy, okay. So, so it, in a way it was a good sign because it meant we're getting there, but it also, it means that we have a lot of, you know, ground to cover still. Uh, if he still feels this way and if his agent still, uh, you know, said to him, well, you're probably not gonna get it. Right. Well, well, the two stars I'm talking to in this movie, the male lead said, I've never been asked to play the love interest before. It's always roles because, you know, I, he's Asian. So he's, I'm like, but you're a movie star. But it's always, yeah. it's, it, in the American world, it's, it's always like you're, you're cast for your role. Well, it's partly the writing, right? So it's like, I got to cast an Asian gang. I got to do a gang in my movie. So it's an Asian gang suddenly. And that's the part, and that's diversity right? in, some, in some people's minds. Yeah. 
That's like, well, there's some colored people in the show. No, it's not diversity. <laughs> I, you're right, Mina. You're right to point that out. I don't think it's diversity either. And then you get to a, 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 another level where you do have to ask yourself about your own implication as a like a white man. For instance, after shooting, after making uh, my internship in Canada, I have like a black mm -hmm. Asian guy and I have like also a native people in the film. And I made a lot of friends and, and, and they came to see me and talked to me about, you know, the, the, the subject of, uh, of the um, uh, boarding schools uh, and mm -hmm. what happened to their parents or them. Uh, mm -hmm. They were snatched out of their, the hands of their parents, brought to boarding schools. A lot of them were abused, sexually abused. And I told them, this is, this, these films have to be made your story has to be told and I can probably help you maybe write it or, but I can't do that. I mean, it has to come from a native director. Um, I think we're there. Maybe 20 years ago, I would have said, yes, this, right. and, and, and then it's certainly a subject that interests me, but to, 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 I think we're at a place right now where uh, they need to tell their own stories, especially when it's charged, politically charged like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you both have talked really enthusiastically about some of the actors you've worked with. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about, you know, how you approach directing actors um, and sort of what your process is with them. I'm guessing it's different for all of the actors you work with. But. Yeah, it is different. And I think part of my job is uh, before the, the shooting start uh, is figuring out what is every, every actor's process. And mm -hmm. I try to be respectful and to uh, adapt myself to everyone's process. Um, in the case of children, it's a little bit different. Uh, and I usually, I work with, with a, a wonderful coach. Um, I am there during the process also, but I, I don't, I can't teach acting. It's, I, I, I can guide and I know what the end result of the film must look like and I can help an actor, but I can't teach acting. So when you work with professional actors who know acting, then I try to get inside their process. So some people like to be left alone before the first take and then be directed after the first take. Other people need to know exactly what to do and who they are and, and what they're thinking of. Uh, um, and, and I've worked with both uh, basically. And, and on Congorama, I was working with this wonderful actor, Olivier Gourmet, a Belgian actor. Mm -hmm. And he, he didn't want to burn his first take. So you, it, 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 uh, it was no use rehearsing. So we were blocking, but he wouldn't. And the other guy, Paul Amarani, he has to know exactly what he's doing. So with one of the guy, I had to work upstream. The other guy, I worked with him downstream. Right. Uh, and I like doing it. I like figuring. And also there's sometimes you get on the set and then there's uh, something going on between actors. You have to be aware of that. Sometimes there's egos and there's an alpha and there's a beta and you have yeah, to yeah. understand what's happening you have to be a psychologist and if you understand what's happening on the set between the actors you're halfway there yeah I think so much of directing actors it's it's so personal between you and the actor but it's always it always to me is grounded in listening trying to find clues trying to find like in that hey how you doing what you do this weekend that conversation could feed you in terms of how they, what their process is, right? And what they're going through. It's, it's, there's no, um, there's no, I mean, there's, I mean, I studied theater before I studied film. So uh, it helps that I have the language of the actor. Like I've, I've done it. I know, I know when they're, I know when it's, they've broken their own rules <laughs> and I can call them on it, right? Uh, if they're too resistant, like there's, you know, one of the tantamount rules of acting is always yield. Yes, and, right? And sometimes you'll get on a set and that actor has decided the scene is, has to be a certain way. And you just have to go up to them quietly and go, you gotta yield, man, you're blocking. And they go, okay, right. You just called me like in theater school, you just called me out, right? But it, it's, never, it's never one size fits all. Every single, I feel like, you know, lockdown film school, one of the things is just to do it. Make a two minute yeah. movie, make a 20 minute sketch, make a, 
I write scripts every day, even though some of them are never going to be movies. Can just you so send a few along, the ones you're not using? <laughs> just the ones you know you're not going to do. Can you just send them along? Because I, it, it, for me, it's always, I like writing and I'm just working out what this, what it is. What do you, what is it? What is it? What, you, what you know, I picked up in my recycling uh, 20 pages of something that I had forgotten I'd written. And I was reading it thinking it was my agent who sent it to me going, this is pretty good. And then it ends. Right. And I went, oh, right. That was like, you know, week two of lockdown <laughs> when I was yeah. trying to work something out. Um, Yeah, directing actors, it's, it's, to, I like rehearsal. I like playing. I like um, getting the cast together, uh, not necessarily reading the script. We don't read, like, I don't, I don't necessarily have to spend time reading the words out, but I want to know what it was like when you first met him that's not in the movie. Uh, you know, what was, your, what was the first time you ever uh, uh, said no to her? Or, you know, like we will improvise scenes like that. Yeah. And that, that gives the actors some playing time without the pressure of this is the scene. Um, and they get to, exp we get to discover backstory together. So that, that, that to me is very important. Like I, I'll do little theater games with a television ensemble um, just so that we break the wall a little bit because it's such a highly charged thing when you're actually on the set, right? Like we're on the clock, we're on yeah. the clock, right? So I'll, like, I think I remember on Long Life, Happiness and Prosperity, Sandra O oh and Valerie Tian, Valerie was not an actor. She was 12 at the time. It was her first role. So we went for dim sum, the, the three of us. And it was just eating together, but you could see that Sandra was working out her physical language with the kid and the kid was trying to figure out Um, how she felt about her mom, even though they weren't in character, we were just eating. But there was something about the way she was, Sandra was serving the kid and making her, making sure that she was cleaned up. That became part of the language for being on set later. So I, I often, to take the pressure off, it's not working on the script per se. We might be working on the characters, but I'm not trying to see if you memorized your dialogue in rehearsal. Like, No, yeah. and it's, it's not our job to do that. For no, sure. uh, yeah. And like I said, it's different with with children. Sometimes you have to do that, but yeah, it, 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 it's it's about being. You're right about listening to actors, and and just like I think one of the best uh, cue we can give sometimes to an actor who's who's searching for the the, the scene is 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 listen listen to your partner, listen yeah. to what he's he's saying. So we tend to 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 stop listening because we know the script by heart and us yes we definitely have to listen just like we have to listen to our dp and our sound guy and mm -hmm. anyone who can have an insight we have to listen to them and we have to absorb all that and and um i i love to read about other people's process other directors process with actors i, I just my, one of my favorite reading is that but at the same time i don't think i i've always said no to go and do a directorial workshop with actors because all I can say is find your own way, find your own process. I can tell you about my process, but I'm not going to show you how to direct with, with, with an actor here in a workshop. It doesn't work like that. And my right. process also changes over time. Um, but uh, I, I remember... Uh, a, a very important scene in Monsieur Lazare at the towards the end of the movie, the child feels guilty because he thinks uh, his his uh, former teacher committed suicide because of him, mm -hmm. and he acts like a tough guy during the film. But at at one point he explodes, and when I auditioned the kid and I decided that we would go with him, his father came to see me and he said, "We have to tell you that my brother, his uncle, committed suicide a year ago." And oh, now wow. you're going to play in that. So, wow. Okay. So, so from, from then on, my job was to just make sure, I mean, I was, I was aware that he was also going through a personal thing at the same time. He was not just going to be acting and, and uh, they had discussed it at, at, in, in their family and they said, we'll, we'll go ahead with it. And on, I remember on the day he had to do the, the scene, and it's probably one of the, the, the most difficult scene I've ever shot. Uh, he was like 
walking alongside the walls and he was looking down and I went to see him and I said, uh, how are you feeling? He said, oh, I'm okay. Are you thinking about your uncle? Yes, I actually I am. And so we discussed and I, I asked him, what do you think is going to happen when you do the scene? What do you expect is going to happen? He said, I think I might start to cry for real and not acting and because I'm going to, re- I'm thinking about my uncle a lot. And I said, what? And I asked him, what do you want me to do if that happens? And he said, well, you keep shooting. So uh, uh, that's, I, I hoped he would say that, but mm-hmm. I, I, I had, it had to come from him. Right. I, I couldn't steal that. And right. I, I had to know that he would be the one deciding if he was going to offer this very personal moment. He was a 10 year old kid mm-hmm. for a fiction film. Right. Uh, so my process was, not, I, didn't, I didn't press any button. I wish I could say, yeah, <laughs> I got that kid to that. No, it, it, life happened. And right. My job was to make sure that it came from him uh, and, from, and, and not forced. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna turn to audience Q&A now, um, just quickly. Uh, we have a question from Dylan Purvis, which is a quite specific screenwriting question. So he asks, from a screenwriter's perspective, what are your thoughts on using flashbacks in your stories? Is it, create, is it a creative crutch? Uh, 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 <laughs> it's, it's like asking, what are your thoughts about like uh, uh, conventional shot counter shot or a, a, a long take or I mean everything has been done really everything has been used it's it's very rare that we uh, find a new language um, and I think it's a crutch if you feel it's a, a crutch uh, and and you, there's going to be a red light flashing and so. Sometimes I use flashbacks, uh, but I also, before using them, I try to invent a scene in the present that would convey the same thing. And if, mm-hmm. I, I, and if I can do that, I'll do that. But if the flashback is, is part of a process that it's bigger and, and because it brings humor or it's playful, or if the past evolves at the same time as the present, I think there's a wonderful film that does that. It's Denis Villeneuve's Incendie. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of flashbacks, but you can't call them flashbacks because what it is, it's the past and the present present are evolving and and you find intersections in between them, although it's not happening at the same time. So so just just make sure that uh, it's not a crutch, yeah? And if you say it's a crutch, it's because it is a crutch. If, if, If a red light is flashing, it's because you have to find another way. I find that when I first started writing, um, I threw every single device into the screenplay. Direct camera address, flashbacks, um, surrealist moments that just pop up. And you'll know, because if you're calling it a crutch, like you said, you know that you're just trying to move deck chairs around and actually not tell this part of the story. So I, I don't, like th- this whole idea of like no flashbacks in a movie or no counter shot, th- everything is a tool. And of it's course. always, it's appropriate at some point. So I, th- I don't have hard and fast rules because it's, you're serving the story. You're not, it's not about me reinventing cinema language. It's like, what's the best thing that's going to br- get yeah. this point across? It's like VO. Every, there's a lot of people that are against VO. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. And I love VO when it's well done. The problem with VO is not the VO itself. And if it's not well done, it's, it's horrible. It's, if it's well done, it's, it's a very powerful narrative tool. But what I do when I use VO, and I've used VO a couple of times, I write at least, I try at least one version without VO. Uh, it forces me to write new scenes. Right. And then I keep the ones that are good. And if I need, and if I want, if, if I want the VO back because I, I feel it's fun and it's good and it's entertaining and it, it fits the project, then I bring it back. But I test myself at least once on one version because uh, I'm not a genius and I usually write like 12 or 13 versions before shooting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll try at least one without VO. And um. For our last question, we're going to ask 
Is there any upcoming Canadian talent that you're really excited about in filmmaking? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in Quebec for sure. There's a lot of, um, women filmmakers, uh, that have done exceptional work lately. Uh, Miriam Vero has shot a beautiful film with the natives on uh, the North shore called Quisipan. Uh, Sophie de Rasp has, has, has made a movie that, uh, that's called Antigone that was Canada's choice this year for, for the Oscars. I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, and um, I, I fear I, I should be, there's this, this is some homework I also should be doing is like watch other people's film more often. The problem is that I watch sports too much on television, but because of COVID, <laughs> I've been catching up. <laughs> uh, I think everyone should see uh, um, The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. A lot, uh, Ella Maya Tailfeathers and Kathleen Hepburn's new film. I think it's brilliant cinema. Um, that's very exciting coming from the West Coast for me. But you know what? I, 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 have, I have the same problem where it's like, if you're writing all day long screen, in screen fiction, I want to watch some dumb show that has nothing to do. Like, you know, I'll watch concerts, like music or... Um, it doesn't help that now our world has turned to Zoom too. So like I'm, I'm doing these, but I'm also getting my yoga class that way. <laughs> or, and so when it's downtime, when you don't, to, to, cause I think one of the things in terms of writing or creating is you need space. And so you don't want too much in your head. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I can't watch like three fiction films in a row and then keep writing. I have to, I, I have to go for a walk actually or ride my bike or something, something different. Agreed. Um, well, we've gone over time, so that's going to have to be it for today's session. But I'd like to thank both of you so much for taking part in this and everyone watching as well. Um, if you've enjoyed the session, we'll be sending out a newsletter soon with information on where to watch Mina's and Philippe's films. You can also listen to a podcast episode we recorded recently on political satires, which discusses my internship in Canada. Um, we're big proponents of Canadian cinema at Seventh Row and we actually interviewed all the filmmakers you just mentioned uh, oh. about The Body Remembers and uh, Sophie Durasp and uh, Miriam Verrault for Kesey Pan. Um, so you can read those on our site. Uh, we're really excited about like all the work that's coming out of Canada, especially in the last decade and actually to spot like Canadian cinema, every two years we publish an ebook on Canadian cinema. So the last one, um, the 2019 Canadian Cinema Yearbook is available on our website at canadiancinemabook.com and it's full of interviews and essays on some of the best recent Canadian films. Um, and with that, uh, thank you again to Mina and Philippe uh, and we'll see everyone next week with a session on production design with Susie Davies, who's a collaborator of Mike Lee's and Stefan Collange, who worked on The Souvenir. Uh, so yeah, thank you both so much. Thank nice you, thank Alex. You thank you, Arla. So and yes. Nice talking to you, Mina, really. Yes, you too. May the, muse be, may the muse be with you, Philippe. <laughs> Likewise, thank you. Yeah, right. And send me those scripts you're not using. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. All right, take Bye. care. Bye-bye.